What is up, everybody? Good morning. Welcome to episode 295. God, that's a lot of episodes. Creeping up to 300 of Hobby Hotline. It's good to be back. My name, of course, is Drew or the DH. Joined today by Victor, the rookie card man himself, and Erica from Love What You Collect. How y'all doing today? Doing good. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, chat. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Yes, what's up, Mad City Brew, Abel in Vegas, uh, Hodges. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. So, uh, like I said, this is episode 295 of Hobby Hotline. Uh, we're live over on Bench Clear Media. And, of course, we'll drop the link in the chat. We would love for you guys to call in, join the show. This is, of course, your show. You control everything if you want to. Um, and feel free to call in. I'm going to post the link right now. Um, if there's any topics, anything that you guys would like to discuss, please feel free to leave it in the chat or call in. You can do video or audio. But uh, guys, let's, I guess, dive right into it. Um, kind of a slow hobby news week. You know, nothing massive, nothing uh, shocking or controversial really to talk about. But one really big thing that did happen, obviously, um, at least that always pushes the hobby forward. Major League Baseball is back. Opening yes. day. Yes, Opening sir. day has happened. We're here. Baseball season is back. So uh, I don't know how big fans of baseball you guys are, but uh, you excited that baseball is back? I am personally. It To me, it. I don't know if it's been the 60-degree temperatures that we've had here in the Chicagoland region in, in the month of February, uh, yeah. but just leading to uh, – opening day to me it's like a holiday I, I i like uh sing that one christmas song it's the most wonderful time <laughs> that's kind of like my vibe that i have that's how excited i get for the baseball season but here my my beloved chicago cubbies my our number one starter ace right uh, justin Steele. yep uh pitching opening day lights out i mean he's just yeah. whipping that thing Whoa. through uh, a swinging bunt situation down the first base line, and he throws out his hamstring. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Yep. So that's kind of a, a bummer right out of the gate. I hope he's doing well. I haven't gotten an update on him yet, but I hope he's doing good. The other thing that I wanted to uh, share was uh, I was watching Quick Pitch this morning, and, and they were talking about Jackson Cheerio, and they, and they, yes. they kind of like brought him up. Um, and you know, this was his first major league at bat first major league game. And here we go. They did all the hype and all the highlights on Jackson Cheerio, but I'm looking for that major league debut patch. Yep. I couldn't find it. Really? I could not oh, find it. Wow. And, and I, I even re rewound it a little bit to kind of, and it was hard to see because he had like a patch on each arm, like a real big patch. Oh yeah, uh, they're they're become, they're becoming soccer jerseys. I mean, right, yeah. everywhere on these things now. So he, he might have had it. I just missed it, and I was looking for it. And I do know I noticed the same thing last year, where you had some key rookies with their first major league debut, and I, I couldn't find the patch on those guys either. So I don't know if this is only for a certain amount of players. Or is it every single major league ball player that makes their debut? I don't know. Maybe the chat can help us. Maybe you guys know a little something about uh, about it that I don't. Well, Eric, I don't know if you have anything um, on that, but uh, no, I'm just very interested to find out that answer as well. You know, if everyone. Well, I had... think I'm really surprised on Cheerio because he's not yeah. somebody that's. You know, he's obviously popular in the hobby. I've sold a lot of his stuff. He moves easily. He sells quick. You have people at shows asking about him. Um, so he's kind of a key rookie. So I'm surprised that you can't see that on him. But it could be you might have to go back all the way to the first inning because, you know, Sue's uh, Yanks chick uh, put up a post showing the uh, Wyatt Langford that he had his pro debut. You could, fizz you could see it. Right. You know, right clear as day that he had his on i don't know if they take that jersey right away or not i mean if you talk to people like greg maddox and stuff from back in the day they they would say in key games that they would go through four or five jerseys and mm. so there's some of these games where they know it's important and they want to maximize how many game use jerseys they can get 
And so I, Maddox has a great story about how he has five jerseys for one of his games um, that are game used. So it's possible that he wore it maybe not even up to the plate, and then they took it off. Hmm. I, I don't know if right. that's how they do it or not. Yeah. But that is interesting because yeah. Big Jackson Cheerio would have it. Um, I don't I, think they do it for every call-up, but, uh, I mean, I could be wrong. I did not – I didn't look at the update. Check. I, w- I would want to take advantage of every call up because you don't know what these guys, they might pop and become something big down the road, especially with baseball. It usually takes these guys a minute to, to get settled in. So I don't know, maybe that's a missed opportunity if they're not doing every, I every call up. Yeah. I also think they should do, I, I always, I don't know. It, it's only like a one of one and I get the one of one, but I think they should have a, MLB debut patch card for every inning that they played in that game. Yeah. Uh, and, and that way we can give the player one, right? Cause they probably want one. Right. Uh, but yeah. then, you know, we, we'll have more than just one. I, I, and, uh, you know, that what you just, something you just said is really interesting. Um, I wonder how many of these players, as you see more and more athletes getting involved in the hobby in terms of actually collecting, like truly being collectors, how many of those guys are going to go back and try and buy those cards of themselves? Yeah. I know if it's me and I'm a collector and I'm playing, I would want that card. I would want that patch for my jersey. <laughs> I mean, at least I would if I'm yeah. a collector, especially, and someone that you know wants some of my stuff. That would be like a, a holy grail of my collection, even yeah. if I'm a pro athlete. And instead of gluing the patch on the jersey, they can put like a piece of Velcro or something, and then maybe yep. inning one, you can they can put it somewhere, and then the following inning, you know, second inning, third inning, so on and so forth. And if he gets pulled out in five after five innings, well, hey, then there's only five. But just giving the hobby a little bit more chance at owning something yeah. as cool as that. Uh, Mad City Brew has a question here, and uh, Eric, I'd love to get your answer on this as well. But uh, as I, he says, you have to think the player has the original patch and collectors are getting a copy. So he's mm. saying that they might not even get the actual patch on the jersey. And that could, like I said, if they're using multiple jerseys like they've done in the past, the Mets famously did this to crank out game used jerseys for uh, multiple different pitchers. Um, you can read these stories from back in the day. There's YouTube videos on them all over the internet. If they're still going through multiple things, which Major League Baseball authenticates everything now, like everything. If you go to a game and sit up close, I've sat right next to the guy. Almost every single piece of equipment that a player touches is brought over to a guy. He writes down what it is and he puts a sticker on it right away. Like they see, they catalog everything is game used now so mm-hmm. i could kind of see them doing multiple jerseys but what do you think do you think they're getting the original patch or are they pulling a fast one on everybody because i mean who knows how how are we to tell oh i would I, I really don't know but that's the interesting theory i wouldn't be surprised yeah you know um i, I don't think there is um a lot of transparency though um, where these patches or items are actually coming from, or you know, uh, and 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 how and and what fashion they were worn. I think I think they do mislead people saying that they were game worn, you know, even though that person could have worn it in the bathroom for five yes. seconds and not actually on the field, but on game day they did, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's just a lot of um, lack of transparency in it, and they just you know just trying to capitalize as much as possible while bamboozling um, the consumers. That's just my personal opinion. Card manufacturers wouldn't mislead us like that. (laughs) (laughs) No, never. They've never done that before. Ever. It would blow my mind. Yeah. But but no, I I mean, it's it's something, um, you know, to think about because these cards command a lot of money. Um, I still think it's in the absolute wrong product. I would like to see this since since we are going to get you get your opening day, guys. But this is a set that moves throughout the year. You know, like more debut patches are going to come every time someone gets called up this year. They're going to have a patch. 
I would like to see them do this kind of like Panini does with a set that I super collect. Um, They're Super Bowl signatures where they put these cards in all different products. You never know the product it's going to be in and you never know what players are going to be in that product. Hmm. That way you can move it across all brands yeah. as opposed to keeping one product and trying to jack up the price of a product that otherwise is going to go pretty cheap normally and putting that in there just for that reason. I would like to see yeah. it moved along kind of spread out among products since it is a, you know, it's, it's a card that, that changes. The checklist is going to grow as the year goes on. That makes and so sense. I would, I would like to see him do it in that way. And I love how Panini has done their Super Bowl signature set. And I've collected it ever since it came out. And I love when I find out because you never know. I love when I see, oh, crap, there's a new one in certified, whoever it may be. Awesome. I'm going to yeah. go get that. I would love to see that. I think it would be awesome. I think it would create a lot of hype for tops around all their products as opposed to one, um, at least for these cards. Yeah, but, you know that that's these cards and just an idea because I I don't like having them all in one set because they move along. You know, get these right. cards out, get them done. They're easy to do. Right. Get them out, but put them in other stuff. You know, spread it out a little bit. Like they got they got me excited last year about it, but then it's like it it came out in what Chrome update? Yes, which came out like in July, August, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, I forgot all about it. Oh. <laughs> 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 you know i don't but i like your idea of spreading it out throughout the year in in different products it's 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 worthy of that kind of treatment in my opinion and well, that i mean that's what i th i mean that i would like to see that personally i think it's i think these i think it's a great idea i would like to see i mean something they never show but I would like to see a lot of is a lot more of them making this stuff. Like Panini put out a great video like a decade ago of them actually making the cards, like putting the cards together, showing the printing facility, showing, you know, the backstage method of getting that card produced, show that stuff. So people actually know, you know, you want to be more transparent. You want all these cool new videos of you visiting a shop, which we'll get to later, whatever it may be for your socials. I mean, show some of this stuff, you know, show, hey, we're taking these debut patches. We're making this card right now that then this athlete will sign it. OK, so Mad City Brew at 1013 seems like he found it. OK, um, on the Churio. What is where is it? The right shoulder under the M for the Milwaukee. OK, so they're tiny. They're small. <clears throat> Um, they are not big like the other patches uh, on the jersey. When Sue yeah. put out that tweet. Sue's put out okay. about what she what would the Wyatt Langford go for, and I'd love y'all's opinion on that because I think it's a good <clears throat> question because he's a really unique case of his first Bowman's out just came out and he just made his major league debut. Doesn't happen much anymore, um, and so I you know he's got all the Bowman people behind him, all the Bowman hype, but now he's also going to pause. I mean. Uh, I think they'll probably save his, maybe save his rookie for next year. Who knows? Maybe he'll drive update. But, you know, her putting that out, it's a good question. What do you guys think the Wyatt Langford is going to go for? Because he's an, he's an interesting case in baseball. Because like you said, Victor, it's normally five years, something like that. You know, you've got the Bowman hype. You got all that. You let that die down. And then you get the rookie hype. Kind of getting that all at once with him. So what do you guys uh, think, you know, that type of card's going to go for? And what do you guys think that demand's going to be? Man, I'm just so, um, to me, I don't know. I, I don't know much about that young man, but I do know that the hype is real. And, yeah. you know, if it, gets, if, it, if it gets pulled sooner rather than later, I think, uh, you know, we don't know if, if that card isn't pulled until late season and he's struggling this season. Yeah. You know, but if it, if that card were to show up today, I think it would it would it would the price would be astronomical. So I don't know. It's hard. Yeah. What about you, Erica? What do you think? It, what do you think this kind of card would go for right now? Um, I honestly do not know. I'm I'm not really much into baseball and I really don't know yeah. much about the player. So I had to bow out on this one. No, un un understandable. And not many, like I said, not many people know much about him, period. A lot of people spending yeah. a whole lot of money on his cards. Right. Know any, how can you know anything about it? Mm -hmm. 
like his his first Bowman just came out. So what is just, it? What's driving the hype? His age or what? I guess. I, I, yeah. I'm not, I've never been someone that's a big prospector. I, I mm. always like to watch someone prove themselves I, in basketball. I always go after guys that I think are going to, you know, peak in or uh, start to make their ascent in year two or three, not their rookie year. I don't really go after the guys that are, you know, hyped up as much, um, but I'm not a huge prospector. So I don't know what the Wyatt like what the Wyatt Langford hype is all about. But I know if you're getting your first Bowman out and you're pretty much jet setting right past all uh, my, the whole minor system. I mean, he had nothing. Um, I mean, now he's here. So, I mean, I guess we just kind of have to see. We're going to watch him grow up on the major league level. You know, always the chance he does get dropped back down, um, you know, which they may do, even though, Service time and things like that are a little different now with the rules um, and incentivized not to do that. So he may stay up the whole time. Who knows? But I, I'd love to hear from the chat what's actually driving the hype of Wyatt Langford yeah. because, you know, I haven't said I haven't seen much yet. And we've got a question from Philly Joe for Victor. Uh, would you consider his first tops now card? Is it his rookie card? Are we talking about who? Who are we talking about? I believe I believe we're still talking about Wyatt Langford, being that he had just had a Bowman and now he's got a tops now. Well, uh, what, what, what did tops play. put on it? They did they put up a call up on it or did they put up a rookie card logo on it? I don't know. Yeah, I haven't seen the card. <laughs> I'm gonna try pulling it up here real quick. Um <laughs> Logan hype beast and flippers. Mike Petty morons are driving the hype and his honest <laughs> opinion. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I love uh, what's hey, uh, I'll, I will I will agree with that, but I will say there Bowman people. <laughs> there's Bowman collectors, man. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what it is. People, I mean, I know so many collectors that just collect Bowman. They're just prospecting guys, and that's their stuff. I don't know why, yeah. I, but I don't know what's driving the massive hype on him compared to a lot of other really, really good rookies that we have this year. I think this is going to be a fun year for baseball in terms of, of uh, call-ups and the minor league system, which that's what I'm more excited about because Hickory Crawdad baseball is almost back, so get to see my crawdads and go to all those games. So looking forward to that. But I love Mookie Chilson. He says, Erica, I'm, I'm a Mets fan. I'm not into baseball either. <laughs> <That's so fun. laughs> hey, well, that's good. I wouldn't doubt the Mets players having multiple um, game use, game use patches either. Cause like I said, the Mets are the ones that are famously known for uh, trying to manufacture as much game use stuff as possible going back to uh, the 90s as well. But uh, as Word says, Langford does lead all Cactus League batters with six homers and all major leaguers with 19 RBI and a 1.228 OPS. All right, so he's legit out the gate. I'll say that. I mean, that's strong. If you're going to yeah. if you're gonna lead all major leaguers, 19 RBIs, but I don't know. We'll see. It'll be fun to watch. Um, but I guess, I mean, I guess he's starting off strong. Morning, Rex. Everybody at the shop. Hope everyone's doing well today. Mike Petty, old prospectors never die. They just smell that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Yes, I agree. Cactus League is not the regular league. But, uh, right, you know, right. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how he does. But, yeah, the hype. Um, I think it's going to be – I think it's going to be a fun baseball season. It's going to be an interesting one in the hobby. I think a lot of players are kind of at that point where it's put up or shut up. You know, you, you only have so many years before people are going to give up on you. And we've got a lot of new people coming in, which is going to take a lot of attention away from uh, a lot of people. A lot of interesting stuff. What's going to happen with the Otani market? What's going to happen with the Trout market? Yeah. Um, is Trout actually going to play baseball for the first time in like a decade? I mean, it's... Yeah. A lot of questions, but baseball is back. I love it. Yes, absolutely. All right, guys. So once again, I'm going to put the uh, link in the chat. If there are any questions, comments, or anything that you guys would like to come on the show and talk about, we would love to discuss it with you. Just click that link, audio or video, either way on your computer or phone. 
just uh, feel free to come on in. But yes, I agree, Collector Dream. It is going to be one fun season. But uh, Victor, um, there was something that you brought up uh, in our chat that uh, I figured was would be a pretty cool topic uh, to discuss this week. And um, it kind of stems from a video that came from Michael Rubin visiting every, everyone's favorite new shop, Cards HQ. But uh, yep. there were some interesting takeaways from that video. Um, I'll kind of let you uh, lead off with this. Yeah, I found it. Um, I, I found it pretty interesting. It was um, kind of a, uh, uh, an episode on the Jeff Wilson show. Yes. He, that's a separate channel that he has, but he yes. was basically going over the visit that Michael Rubin gave mm -hmm. uh, the visit that he did to the store. And I found it pretty interesting. I, I ended up trying to pull some context clues from that and, and trying to get my take as I reflected on that video. Now, I wish I would have been a fly on the wall and, and could have heard the entire visit. Right. But we just right. got, little clips, fast oh, yeah. moving clips through the editing. Right. Um, yes. But I did notice first off the gate that Michael Rubin, I did, just asking a ton of questions, like, like right out of the gate. Yes. And, and it reminded me of uh, when, when I was in management at, at my job, upper management would come in and visit on occasion. Right. Yeah. And when they visited, the first thing they would do, they, they wouldn't even say hello but the first thing they would do is start firing questions off, right? Just question mm -hmm. after question after question to see if, I, I guess, to see if you're on top of things, to see if you know the numbers. And and it's just, uh, it, it's one of them things where I, I never liked that type of move to me. It was more of like a, like a power play, like a power struggle, like a yeah. type uh, gimmick that the management likes to play, you know what I mean? And he just came off like a, like a machine gun, just asking question after question. And I, I was a little taken back by that. Uh, I never have been a, a fan of that kind of, right. uh, of engagement, but, uh, it, it was, it was, uh, it was really good in the aspect of some things that Michael Rubin had said where he was, where he was basically saying the, some of the, key elements of what they have already established mm -hmm. in the hobby. And that is the MVP buyback program, the um, MLB debut patch card, and basically getting athletes involvement, uh, having the athletes themselves be the marketing tool for the product. And, and that was kind of the, the, the main things that they, and I, I guess I wanted to pose that question to the chat. How do we feel about those three things? The the buyback program, the debut patch, and athlete involvement, athletes involved in the marketing. Um, is it a feather in their cap? Personally, I think it is. I, I think it's something that I think where, where the hobby had been maybe complacent or, or doing the same thing year after year, yeah. and they actually really did bring an element of – excitement through that um I, I'll, I'll let you guys talk on that erica uh um i i honestly i'm really just like uh um uh, i feel as though they could be doing so much more and so much and, and so much in, in a more authentic and um a, a more captivating way um for the current consumers and incoming consumers. So um, I'm just really not impressed with, with the things they've done so far. Like, like I'm not I'm upset, but I'm just, it doesn't move the needle for me. You know, um, with, they have, they, they, they have all the tools to make different things happen, but, um, you know, they have their own agenda. And I don't know if their agenda is what's best for um, the current hobby um, or even future consumers as well. Okay, well, I uh, actually, you know, from the three things that you brought up, Victor, I think, mm -hmm. I think those aspects of what they've done have been great. I think it's a good idea. I think the buyback program is awesome. Um, I would like to see them do more with it. I think there's more they can do post buyback and pre buyback to kind of make that more interactive all year long. Um, and I'd like to see some cool stuff done with those cards. Uh, Tim Carroll makes something. I don't know. There's a lot of options you can do with uh, 
with those cards that you get. Um, the one thing that I will say is the athlete engagement. I love, um, the trade nights, the, the trading card days and stuff, which he didn't really mention, but the trading card nights that they've been having at hobby shops and, you know, just randomly, uh, in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, we have, you know, massive, you know, superstars showing up at a hobby shop across the country at random nights and things like that. I love that. And I love the athlete engagement part, but at the same time, I do agree, Eric. It's not, I think it's a good start. I'll put it that way. It's a great start, but mm -hmm. I want to see, I want to see a little bit more. I think innovation is ridiculous. Um, the, the talk, they talked so much about innovation and everything like that. That's great in the marketing and all that stuff and all the social media and whatever, the athlete engagement, that's awesome. But how about on the cards? Because you just put out a Victor Wembanyama freaking tops and out card. That's literally a downtown. Like it's a Panini downtown. Let's be honest with a ridiculously stupid rookie card logo on it, which I'll let, but I don't know if you like the logo Victor, but I think it's hideous, but it's literally a downtown. There's no innovation there whatsoever. It's a blatant ripoff of the, the home field advantage, which is a ripoff of the downtown. Um, but I mean, company has been doing that for a long time, but I want to see more of this innovation in the actual cards. Like I, I don't see it in the cards. I see it in other areas and I think that's great. I think that's the way you're going to get more new people into the hobby. But I would, I, I think there needs to be an overhaul in the, in the actual thought process of the, design elements and things like that. If you're going to preach innovation, I would like to see a lot of testing being done, especially when you have an on-demand pro uh, product and line that you can do all this testing on. You don't have to make full products and all this stuff, but test some stuff out, test the waters a little bit more. But overall, I think it's a good start. Yeah. And we can talk about that, that tops Wimby card in just a minute, but I, I had another question that I wanted to pose yeah. When, it, when it came to this interview with Michael Rubin. Uh, so in it, I, I picked up, they were, they, they did a segment talking about old card shops versus new card shops. And, and they understood the nostalgia of old card shops. And, and they, you know, they kind of based it off of um, chaos and paneling on the walls type of thing, <laughs> just a real old dingy 1980s, 90s type feel to it. And, and what, what Ruben and fanatics are wanting more is the kind of what cards HQ has to offer something a little bit yes. more aesthetically pleasing to the eye type yes. of card shop. And I guess, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I would love to hear the opinion of the chat and, and you guys, it, but is this a fact, is this something that the hobby actually needed? Do you want to see card shops updated? Okay, because I, I know I'm I'm 53 years of age and I, and I grew up through the 80s and 90s inside of card shops, literally. Uh, sure. But but I, I do know that when I go into that type of card shop today, um, I do feel that it does lack in customer service a bit. I do feel that it lacks in modern cards a little bit. I do feel that it that it's a little outdated. Uh, um, and and I, I don't know, sometimes I get, not on all shops that I go to, but some shops uh, that are outdated, it, it just feels a little creepy in there. And <laughs> and my I find my visit to be a little shorter than I expected. Yeah. And so I, and I wanted to know, is that just me feeling that way? Or is that like other hobbyists feeling that way? Eric, I'll let you go first. Um, that, that's a good question. You know, um, this, this, this tug between, you know, updating the older card shops, making them more current. It, I understand why, why there's a tug and there's a want for it, but I believe there's a place for everyone. I think what it comes down to is, um, more or less tracking to see what numbers are from all card shops type of thing. You know, the actual numbers, you know, uh, the profits and losses, I think that's the most important piece, not the aesthetics of it, because at the end of the day, it's 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 a hundred it's a hundred people per hour that go to 
a broke down McDonald's and a nice new McDonald's. People, you know, so it's yeah. the same. It doesn't matter necessarily how it looks. It's about how, what kind of service they get out of it and the product they get out of it. And you can get great service and great product out of an older hobby shop with leaks everywhere and carpet patches all over the place. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can. Yeah. But at the same time, you can also get terrible service, just like a comment I just read. You know, the the hobby shop owner or the worker not properly educating. Yes, on the hobby. crowd. Yeah. You, but you can also get that at the old hobby shop and the new mm -hmm. one. So I just think that a lot of the issues are just across the board, depending on the person or the organ, the, the business running things. Um, but all in all, I do think that if, you know, if um, Fanatics continues in, in this space, they will push for um, pleasingly aesthetic hobby shops and they will push the older ones out. Um, that will be their plan. Yeah. My I could see okay. that possibly happening in terms of the aesthetics part because they do want to, I mean, if you're someone that's new to the hobby, I think the aesthetically pleasing hobby shops are probably the ones that are going to bring in, in their eyes at least, more new customers. And they probably do. And I'll, I'll give a good example of a shop that is both new like brand new state of the art, but also amazing service. Double A Mint down in South Florida. They just opened up a new shop. I got a chance to visit it. I know Mark and them really well. And it's a perfect uh, example of a functioning card shop with all of the new amenities and everything that you see in these crazy, uh, you know, Cards HQ type of places. But with the same staff, the, a knowledgeable staff, choices of wax choices of singles all the way down on the wall you know it's not a museum it's stuff that you can actually purchase and it's very it's very collector friendly and when i went and visited on a random day of the week the amount of foot traffic in there was insane um but i i am a little worried about the card shops that you know are not you know, the most aesthetically pleasing or don't, I think, I think the ones that don't adapt to the social media aspect, which you have to nowadays, um, the ones that don't adapt to the social media aspect. I mean, if you're not selling online, I really don't know how you're in business right now as a card shop, honestly, like online sales have to be a big part of your, uh, inventory. I would assume, um, at least looking at other shops that I know to be quite successful, but I think, the ones that don't adapt, at least the social media aspect and showing things and, you know, being involved. Well, fanatics, yeah, they are going to want the hobby shops that are going to have the content, do the content and make the stuff for them. So I could see some of those LCSs possibly dropping off. But I agree, Victor, also with what you said that, you know, a lot of the the dingy rundown shops and things like that, a lot of times they are, it feels like they're just there. You know, they're mm -hmm. not really there to help you. But if if you're not there to help, if you're not there to educate, if you're not there to pull people in the doors, I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those things where I think at that point, it's just a, a fun little project for them. It's not something they're taking seriously, which right. a lot of hobby shops are just second jobs for people, you know? Yeah, yeah. And also, too, I always wonder, you know, uh, fanatics, wh who is their main target that they're focusing on? Is it the current... Yeah. The hobby or is it the new consumers they want to get right. you know so mm -hmm. that is a whole different conversation of right. which way they're pivoting right. obviously if it's the new consumers mm -hmm. they will want you know the, the new shop or the glitz and glam right. the lounge type vibe and you know the trendy that's trend. so um it, it just kind of boils down to that uh i in my opinion i think they lean towards the new consumers because if they want a hundred x <laughs> the space mm -hmm. they would have to so right. um that's a great point erica and i think their concern is what happens when this new collector goes into this outdated shop what kind of yes. experience are they going to have and that's the kind of the rub right so it's one of them things where i guess we'll i don't know hope for the best going forward yeah yeah I agree, and, but it does. It, I mean, it is, Eric, you posed a, a great question right there. And it is a, you know, it's a separate topic, but who are they going after with this? Are yeah. they going after, you know, are they trying to appease the collector base that they have that is literally 
pumping money into this while everything changes or are they trying to pull in the new people that don't have skin in the game yet you know i mean obviously their answer is going to be both but you can't really make those moves to appease both or at least i haven't seen them do it effectively yet i would like to see them do it yeah. um but to kind of round about to what uh victor had asked at the beginning i do think it is a you know it's a good start but it is worrisome a little bit because who knows you know i mean what what are they gonna do but i do love you know one of the things that he didn't mention and i will say it again i love what they are doing with hobby shops and some of these shops are just regular run-of-the-mill shops that they're that they're focusing on right now but we're seeing more and more of these destination shops if you will kind of pop up and at what point is that going to be, you know, their sole focus? And are the others going to fall by the wayside? Card Vibe here says we need both for a, a healthy, happy, in my opinion. And and I agree. I completely agree. I think both are very, very much needed for the hobby because every collector is not the same in any way. And all want a different experience. And some people yeah. want that old school throwback vibe where they go in and they're looking at old old right. school stuff you know that a lot of these new places don't have some do right i mean some do like market double a they've got a great dollar box vintage all that but a lot of these other places don't and so mm -hmm. you know it, it's all about that experience like that's you said, a great point you get that's a great point too yep yep and on the flip side right imagine an old head going into a new shop. Right. <laughs> it's probably yes. It's not his game where you see five people breaking boxes and you yeah, know, everything's yeah. up. You know, it's probably not where he wants to be. And so that's where I, I think you definitely need both, you know, yeah. and I like, but I do like seeing shops update. I mean, we had a shop here in, a, yeah. in North Carolina recently. They just expanded a little bit, put a nice little, they didn't do much. It's a small shop, but they added in a nice little area for people to sit, trade, mess around, you know, just more room for themselves and more room to put some product out, made the shop look a little nicer. I think things like that, I mean, obviously, if you want to have a successful shop, you should always want to make it look better, in my opinion. But, you know, I think you need, I think you need both of them. Yeah. Really, in all honesty, I just hope that both continue to stay and yeah. that we can kind of celebrate some of the new openings of some of these smaller shops and not just focus on these destination type shops, but just my opinion on that. All right. Talk to me about Wimby now. That's all I had on the, on, on that. Sure. Day. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, moving on. Um, so the Wimby, uh, that tops kind of through a last minute announcement at everybody with dynasty baseball that just came out. They uh, had thrown in some Wemby autographs. And, of course, they had to put a patch from uh, when he threw out the first pitch in his Yankees uniform and everything on there. And the 101 was pulled last night, late last night uh, by Blaise Brakes, uh, the one where he's drawn an alien on there. Um, looks like some kind of tattoo on his face. Uh, ships, I don't know, all this crazy stuff, but um victor i wanted to bring it up just because uh yeah. you were on the show today and it was interesting when we when this came out we talked a lot about it on mummy at that potograph but do you consider this card which in the mock-ups had a pretty much rip off of panini's rookie card logo on the card and it was labeled as a rookie card but when they put the card out they don't have a rookie card logo on it so is this do you, do you consider this a Wemby RPA? Do you consider this a Wemby rookie? Because, I mean, let's be honest. This is as close as we're going to yeah. get to a Wemby RPA. Like, yeah, yeah. Lawless, all this stuff that's about to come out that is all RPA driven. Wemby's so, not going to be. I mean, right. his cases aren't there. So so Blaze pulled this last. I wonder how many cases he opened to get that sucker. God, who? I mean, there's not a lot of Dynasty put out, you know. I mean, right. I saw right. the Beatles, uh, the big jumbo Beatles card had already been pulled by uh, Anthony Laparo and Top Notch. Um, a lot of big cards have already been pulled out of it because not a lot of it's made. Um, but yeah, yeah, Wemby popped out right away. But I, but is it, is it you know a rookie card really? I mean, he's in a Yankees uniform. He's it's in a baseball yeah. product. Yeah, it, it's 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 one of them things where, you know. 
I'm I'm asked this question, and I, I had a couple of people uh, DM me that that card and and with the with the rookie card logo of Panini, and I was like, that that has to be some kind of Photoshop mock up type. I don't know what's going on there, but that that didn't look right to me. Um, but it's one of them things where I answered as, that question like this: it's not so much what what I think or what I say; it's it's what what do the rules say? And and when you look at the the breadth of scope of my content is basically I've resurrected the the guidelines from the past, kind of updated them because some some rules were outdated, and I applied the the rookie card rules that were given by the Players Association in 2006, and I've okay. merged the two and kind of created this hybrid of sure. rookie rookie card guidelines and best practices. So when I take this Topps Dynasty card of Victor Wemby, it's not what does Victor say. It's what do the rules say? Yes. And when, when I filter that card through the rookie card guidelines and best practices, that card of Victor Wembanyama does not qualify for a true rookie card designation. And I'll even go even a step further and say that anything of Victor Wembanyama produced by top slash fanatics is not considered a true rookie card. Now, well, that's it. I'm not saying that they're not worthy of being collected because they right. most definitely are. Some of them are pretty cool looking. Yeah. Um, but when we're when we're trying to establish and identify and classify certain mm -hmm. cards as rookie cards, those cards fall short. Yeah. No. So, so no on the on that question. Now, uh, why? Well, okay, let's look at it. Um a, a true rookie card is a player's base card established in their debut uh, year of the of their specific sport. Right. When Benyama is a basketball player, not yeah. a baseball player. So there's. Yeah. there's, there's I wanted there's... to ask. That was one thing I wanted to ask. Is you know how how are we going to translate a rookie card that's in a baseball right. product? Like <laughs> right. It, so that's strike one. Strike two is going to be that it has to be licensed by the Players Association and mm -hmm. the league. So yeah. if we flip that card over, we're going to see that it's not properly licensed by the NBA. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 then strike three, it has to have a rookie card logo somewhere on that card, and it doesn't have that either. So in, in, in just – and, I mean, there's more, but just those three right, right there disqualifies it as a true rookie card. No. I I completely agree. I I completely agree, one hundred percent. It's probably a good thing they didn't put the rookie card logo out because yeah. if they put the one they had on the mock up out, it's Whew. probably going to be exhibit twelve hundred and fifty in court for Panini if they it did. Sure would have, um, because it was a massive rip uh, rip off of uh, their rookie card design, but uh, they or logo, but they ended up not putting that on that card, but. Um, Erica, what do you think about these cards? You know, like Tops is kind of doing this quite a bit with Wemby. A lot of comments here saying they'd love to see Tops put out a card of Wemby actually holding a basketball. And that's the thing. We've had cards, but none of them. I mean, yeah, they're worth collecting, like Victor said. But what do you think on it? Like about these cards that Tops is doing with Wemby right now? Um, Victor, he uh, spot on, um, spot on with that. I, I do think it's a little dis not a little. It is very disappointing that we don't get um cards of Vic, uh, of of um, Wimby and with a basketball. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's just it's sad. I feel bad for the consumers because it's just like uh, you know, they don't they don't care enough to just you know make a a better product with him in his actual sport, you know. So I don't really care for the, him in the baseball stuff. It's just okay, so M Mookie has a really cool, interesting comment here, and and uh, I kind of uh, have a, a thought on some of this. I want to get y'all's opinion on it. it. Says Tops is crossing over, introducing baseball collectors, the biggest collector base. I don't know about that anymore, but to Wemby, priming them to get ready for Tops basketball when it comes. There's a ten year plan at work here. Um, I do agree that they're definitely priming people for when they get other products and things like that. I 100% agree with you there, but I, I like, you know, I don't know if I like the idea so much of all the, I, I hope the crossing over of like putting Wemby and Tate stealing these athletes and what is CJ Stroud 
going to be in Dynasty, you know? Are they saving him for Chrome Update? Like, I mean, what uh, what are they going to do? They've got Stroud. They've got yeah. all these players. They're not using them at all. You know, yeah. they they don't use them at, for anything. But, I mean, what are they going to do with them? And, you know, the biggest thing being, are they considered rookies? But like a lot of commenters are saying, a lot of co- people right now that are spending money don't even care about the rookie card rules. And that's fine if you don't. But a lot of true old school collectors and a lot of diehard collectors do care about that rookie card designation. It's a big deal um, to a lot of people. And so, you know, it, it's interesting to say the speed. But, yeah, I, it to me this Wimby it's a it's it's a gimmick card. Okay, now if I'm going to yeah. use a gimmick card to sell product, I, I, hey, I get it. I'm okay with it. If you want to use a gimmick and throw them in there, but I think uh, you got to be careful of doing that too much, and and I think that's going to start causing some yeah. feathers to get ruffled if that becomes again. Now if they start throwing C.J. Stroud in there, and now they're they're starting to mix and and you know too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, confusion is going to end up happening. Yep. Well, you've already got products like that. You've already, I mean, you've already got stuff. If you want to put them in there, you've got Ginter, you've got, you know, all yeah. these other things that you put yeah. out, use it, you know use what that. I mean? Like, right. like right. use your established stuff instead of trying to push it in products that don't need it to sell it. Like tops dynasty did not need that card. Tops right. dynasty would have sold out in a heartbeat. Without Correct. that Wemby card in it, well said. In a heartbeat, well said. And so that's where it's just like, it, but if you're gonna do it, at least put it in something that a the average collector has a chance of getting, because the average collector does not have a chance in hell of getting into Dynasty. I mean, this shit's ridiculously expensive. But you know, it. I don't know. Wrong move, in my opinion, but we'll see. Uh, I Obviously, there's a plan in works, going back to that comment, and I do think they are trying to prep people for what they've got coming. They have started to put out their rookie card logos and things like that, which I pray they're just testing. But, you know, they, they're doing a lot of work, so we'll see. We'll see what happens on it all. When be crammed into a race car. All right. Yeah. Hey, let's put him in everything. <laughs> everything but a pen. I would actually like to see that. That'd be interesting. Oh, man. Classic. <laughs> I think they just got WWE. You could put like Wemby versus uh, Andre the Giant or something like that. See who measures up. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> interesting. Uh so to speak, yeah. but we'll yeah. see what happens. We'll see what this Wemby card goes for. Um, and we'll see how everything, uh, everything shakes out. Yep. So, uh, guys, we're, uh, got a little more time before we wrap up. One thing that is going on right now, I don't know how much you guys are uh, paying attention to it, but I figure we touch on it cause it's interesting to me. And we got, obviously March madness is going on where mm-hmm. we have baseball opening day. We talked about, but You've also got March Madness, which used to be kind of this massive showcase for who are we collecting next year? Who's, you know, like this is when the standout guys, I mean, go back to Carmelo. I mean, Carmelo made him himself one of the most collected and chased people in the hobby by his tournament run, you know, and there's been a lot of people that have done that before. Does it still feel like that in the NBA? Because to me, I'm watching the tournament and it's a blast. I think the women's tournament's better because there's a lot more competition and a lot more spread out evenly matched teams. But is it still, does it still give you that excitement of March madness where, I mean, in terms of the hobby, because to me, I, I mean, show me the guys that are standing out to you that are going to be massive chases next year. I, I just, I don't see it. And I, I haven't seen it for a couple of years. Who have the chases been? All overseas players that didn't even play in college. So what do you guys think about March Madness and, you know, its effect on me now? Uh, uh, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I don't think it has much of an effect anymore. It has um, died down tremendously. The And you would think that it would, it would ramp up with the age of social media. And the yeah. age of Kanye, you would think it would be more ramped, but uh, people are just not really um, interested and invested in the the men's players as much as they used to be. Um, I don't, 
I don't know. I, I think it might be a generational thing too. Like with this younger generation is not yeah. as attached to an athlete versus when we were coming up, we were pretty much attached to athletes in terms of what we wore. We wore athletes clothes and shoes and we saw them on every commercial and da -da -da -da. Oh, yeah. like today is, is the attachment for the, is, is not the same. So I think that's what the biggest thing is. And then it leads to you watching the games on a men's side in particular, you might watch it to enjoy some basketball, but you don't really know who is who and you don't know much about them. And, and a lot of times people don't really even care to even like try to learn to a certain degree, no offense to the players, but, um, but yeah, so that's a no. On the women's side, um, things have ramped up. So, yeah, I I agree. It's um, the, and I agree in the comments here with uh, Stokes. One and done definitely, you know, has hurt the NBA a lot or, or hurt college a lot. But um, it's also just, I mean, and you would think it would ramp up more because now you've got Bowman. You they're trying. You know, you've got a whole. Now we've got the NIL deals, so you're getting these car these players. Uh, cards of these players years in advance in some cases uh, especially in football you're going to have them for three years in some cases before they even go pro um, obviously not some of the ones that started off when they were already in but eventually you're going to have players that are going to have three years worth of Bowman U cards before they hit the NFL and yep. same and but with basketball you've kind of got one year for the most part some guys too but like I said, who's been the most impactful people in the last couple of drafts? People that didn't go to college. Like they were either players foreign from overseas or they were players that like the uh, the Thompson rookies that came from overtime elite or any of these kind of new NBA, you know, programs. And so it's just it's weird to me because March Madness, like you said, I mean, it used to be a huge thing. I remember when it was basketball season, you couldn't walk into a gas station without seeing Grant Hill on Sprite and uh, or a crunch stand up, crunch bar stand up. You know, they had basketball players on candy bars like it was everywhere. Everywhere you went was March Madness, this March Madness, that. And, you know, a lot of attention was put on these guys. And I just it's not there anymore. I just I just don't see it there anymore. And I think it's, you know. It's sad for college basketball, but I do like seeing what's happening with the women's game. The women's game's improving. Like I said, I have thoroughly enjoyed the women's NCAA tournament. It has been incredibly competitive. But uh, the March Madness just doesn't have the same feel, at least for the hobby, that it once did. I remember in the 90s, 2000s, stuff like that, March Madness was really important for the, for the upcoming collecting. But there's no real big superstars that come and stand out anymore. Well, I think, <clears throat> I think it's, um, you know, we get, and we got to be curious. This is the danger of prospecting and the, and the danger of, of hype, right? Because we expect standout players to yeah. be coming in every single year. And that definitely is not the case in the hobby. There have been some rookie year classes that have been, very very weak and and okay. that might that might be what we're seeing right now and but i mean we can also look at upcoming players when we look at anthony edwards and the and the, his his season i i think he is an up and comer who is going to be a, a major all star um sga also say gilgis alexander is another guy who's really coming out of his shell oh, yes. and they're, they're actually they're growing in their game they're developing right they weren't all that in the beginning when they first came out, but today yep. you can tell that these guys are going to the next level. Jalen Brunson put up 61 no, last night. There's, there's another another prime example. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, every year isn't going to be a spectacular year. Some yeah. you're going to have weak rookie year classes. As far as on the woman's side of things, I've always been a big fan of, of, um, you know, women's basketball. I, I actually remember back in 1997 with the, when the WNBA first started, I was a car dealer back then, and mm -hmm. I invested a lot of money into women's basketball, and uh, it did very. I did very well with that, and I, I pulled out a few cards. Here's my uh, Cheryl Swoops. Oh, very nice card. I remember those. Yeah, Rebecca Lobo, right? And here's the Cheryl Swoops, right? Great female athletes that really, to me, are pioneers of the game because I was following it so closely back then. But they really were standout players in their era. But I think as the WNBA 
started and, and was, you know, year after year uh, coming into the 2000s. I just think the, the games got a little boring. And, and I think oh, that's that's where it starts to hurt the the hobby because what mm -hmm. we're looking for is excitement right we're, we're yep. looking for but when the games start becoming boring a lot of turnovers a lot of layups it just we lose interest now caitlin clark comes around and she starts throwing threes from the from the <laughs> <laughs> from from the nba you yeah. know uh it's just breaking records demolishing records and we're seeing this exciting player and it's causing other players from other teams to kind of come up and kind of like compete against her. And now we're seeing this competition and we're actually seeing some really awesome play. And that's what we're seeing is the excitement generated with, with all of it. And so I don't know, to me, that's the, the, the long and short of it. It's just a matter of um, we're going to have, weaker classes than others and it all comes down to exciting play are we gonna are we seeing the highlight reels of exciting players yeah no i i completely agree um it's uh nba has become i mean you watch it with the lakers i mean and lebron for example let's just take them they look like an average team 99% of the time. And then what happens in season tournament where there's some extra money on the line? Oh, they look amazing. They look like a great team because they're trying. Half these guys aren't trying until February. I mean, maybe. And sometimes even later. That's why. why I mean, because playoff basketball is still extraordinary, at least in my eyes. I think playoff basketball in the NBA is still great, even though the – the rules and everything are a little different um, and not exactly what I love, but playoff basketball can still be incredibly, you know, um, entertaining in my eyes. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's not the same. They're not, they're not uh, the NBA game. You can obviously see half the players not trying, half the players don't care, but then you do have those guys that are grinding every night. Um, but so we'll I think the league is trying, I think they did that tournament in the beginning of the season. Yeah, I thought that brought some exciting game. I watched a few I loved it. games. Yeah, I actually thought the in season tournament was a good idea. I, I didn't think it was a good idea. It made no sense to me when I heard it. It just I didn't yeah. understand it. But hey, if it makes teams try for an extra couple of weeks and I get some interest, I mean, is it a, is it a coaching issue? I mean, are we having like a coaching issue? I don't know. I I don't know. I I think it's just. I think it's one of these things where people, these teams just think they can coast into the playoffs. I mean, some teams grind all year long. You got teams like the Timberwolves, Anthony Edwards driving them right now. You got teams like the Thunder who and Shea and all them, they're trying to really make a name for themselves. The Knicks, yeah. a lot of different teams that are really trying to push hard all year long to secure those spots. But I think the upper level teams just look at it as we're going to win enough if we try halfway because there is a massive difference between who makes the playoffs and who doesn't you know yeah and so i think i just think that half of them don't try until they and i i think an effort problem personally okay i think it's just effort on you know uh the part of this generation i don't i don't think they care until it's time and I, for and it I don't, to matter it, and I, I I heard Michael Jordan talk on this uh, not too long ago, but it, it's one of them things when you give a young player like that and you give him three hundred million dollars in his yeah. first couple of years, what else does he have to try? Why, why does he have to try? Yeah. He has three hundred million dollar contract. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You give He's him good. the world too soon, and and that's what happens. Well, especially when you also have role players. I mean, a role player in the NBA now, you're making 45, 50 million. You know, your contract's three, four years for 50, 60 million dollars. It's yeah. absurd. Yeah. So that could be part of the problem. Yeah. No, I completely agree. All right, y'all. Well, it is uh, 12 o'clock here. So I guess we'll start to, yeah, I know flew by today but uh, i guess we'll start wrapping up the show today uh before we go victor and erica um you guys got anything uh i know all of us right for hobby news daily any new articles or anything up you guys would like to plug um i would just like to say um the women's games are on today yes. on ABC. 
Fifty at one and three, and then I think the last two are ESP and following. So definitely tune in. Um, all four games will be um very good, very good. So enjoy. They are. Yeah, I got um, I got a article I just released or uh, for Hobby News Daily yesterday. It is uh, basically about Shohei Otani and some of the issues that I see uh, with athletes um, having their lives under such a microscope with social media. The, the title of the article is Say It Ain't Show. And um, just some reflective thoughts is typically what I like to do and if with current hobby happenings. And Shohei Otani is the topic for this month's article. So you can check that out. Nice. All right, guys. Well, that is going to wrap up episode 295. I've also got an article up on Hobby News Daily, Iconic Inserts, where we look back at Pinnacle Masks Hockey, one of my favorite inserts. So uh, make sure to go check that out. And, of course, we are live every single Saturday at 11 a.m. on Bench Clear Media. So make sure to tune in next week for an all-new cast and characters and uh, – some big hobby news, but you guys hope everyone has a great weekend. Uh, happy Easter to everyone. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Y'all have a good day. Peace. Mm-hmm.